Mukunda and I also lived in a loft, and in front of our loft was a music room. We had a couple of pianos, we had a harpsichord, we had a couple of drum sets, we had guitars, we had uh, sitars, a music room. Front window of the building, and then I would hear Janice. Janice coming from down the street. And so I would walk to the front window and he'd be standing down there calling to me. So I'd run downstairs and let him in. And he'd come upstairs and he came calling on me like that. And uh, Mukunda wasn't there. So he, 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 would, he would just come to talk. I also think that he really, he wasn't in a safe place. The person he was sharing a loft with was on drugs and periodically would go nutto on him. And he didn't, you know, wasn't feeling safe. So he would come over. Mukunda and I were often fasting. And if not fasting, we were eating one bowl of brown rice a day. Microbiotic diet chewing it 50, each bite 52 times, so like that. And I didn't have any food to offer him. And he called me on that. He said it's proper to offer somebody some food stuff. I didn't have anything. We had a block of uh, government-issued cheddar cheese that was, I think, a five-pound block of cheese that had been in the house a really long time. I did have oranges because I was craving oranges. And in New York, they have vendors that will sell fresh orange juice on the street. So I got myself a little orange juice squeezer and some oranges, and I offered him that. I was able to offer him. I. I it didn't occur to me to give him oranges, but I gave him orange juice. He liked that very much. He thought that was quite lovely. So that was our beverage of choice when he would come to visit. Lived in the temple, started going out every day on Hari Nam and book distribution with Siddha Vidya Prabhu. And then in 1974, we did traveling Sankirtan to the San Francisco Rathiatra. And that was the first time I ever gazed on Srila Prabhupada and it was quite remarkable because the morning of the Rath Yatra parade it was raining and very you know it was, it was raining quite hard and, and I thought oh boy this is going to spoil everything and um, and then Srila Prabhupada's car arrived and I can see it just like it was yesterday. The back door opened and Srila Prabhupada's lotus foot I could see came out the door and touched the pavement and as soon as it touched the pavement, immediately the sun broke through. And it, and it was just like remarkable. It was like you turn on a switch and the light comes on, but it was like Prabhupada's foot touched the asphalt on the street and all of a sudden the sun came out. And uh, I was thinking, oh my God, Vivasvan is paying his respects to Srila Prabhupada, uh, you know, that you know, Srila Prabhupada has come. And that was my very first experience of actually, I, I had been serving in the temple and doing book distribution for about a year, and he had initiated me a few months prior, but I had never actually seen him in the physical form. And Prabhupada sent us a telegram to Tamal Krishna and said, come to Los Angeles immediately. And we found out that Prabhupada was forming the GBC and so he said, you should write a letter to Prabhupada asking for initiation, which I did, a couple of other devotees also. And I went with him to the airport. I was like his secretary and the treasurer. And uh, he and Madri and myself were at the airport and 
they just offered obeisances and he left. I, I was amazed how detached he was, and she was too. I guess it was doing so much sankirtan that brought that out. And uh, so he became one of the original GBC men. We got the letter from Srila Prabhupada in August of 1970, and he said, you are, I, he said, I appreciate your humble approach to the spiritual master. And your spiritual name is Lochananda Das Brahmachari. He said, the meaning of your name is one who takes pleasure when he sees the form of Krishna with his eyes. And then to show the root of the name in the Brahma Samhita, he quoted the verse, Premanjana Churita Bhakti Valochanena. In other words, uh, if you anoint your eyes with the pulp or the salve of love of God, then you will be able to see Krishna face to face. And so, and I am the servant of such a person. <laughs> and uh, he said also, as far as the purpose of your life is concerned, I mean, now this is the guru speaking. You already know that my mission is to spread Krishna consciousness throughout the world. He said, everything is provided by Krishna's arrangement to maintain all living entities throughout the creation. The only thing missing is Krishna consciousness. And when I read that, I immediately gave up any interest in going into the medical field because this is the higher service. This is the, the uh, summum bonum of human life is to engage in devotional service to Krishna and to uplift mankind. I understood that at that point. So I surrendered to Krishna and, of course, to Prabhupada, Krishna's representative. You can't have one without the other. <laughs> well, the first time I saw Srila Prabhupada was in 1969 at the Rathi Atra in Golden Gate Park. And I was not a devotee yet. I was coming to the temple regularly, but I, I really wasn't clued in so much about what was going on. So I had a tiny baby. And I was more focused on him than Srila Prabhupada, but I did see him in the Rathiyatra. I was always impressed by the devotees. Mm -hmm. I, used to, I used to sit in on Berkeley, on, um, I guess, at University Avenue, and watch the devotees chanting and distributing books. And they, um, actually, the first time I met a devotee, which is just a funny story, is there was a brahmachari, and I went up to him, I said, what are you doing? And he said, I have no idea. <laughs> but he gave me a book, and I read the book, and that, that was the beginning. <laughs> and then I started coming to the temple in Berkeley. So I was in the back, and everyone paid their obeisances, and I wanted, so I stuck my head up. I wanted to see him, and he laughed. <laughs> he laughed and smiled at me. <laughs> it was nice. And when he looked at me that time, when I had bowed down and looked up, I realized that no one in my life had ever loved me. That was the first time that I had ever been loved, truly loved, was by Srila Prabhupada. That was, that's why I'm still here, I'm sure, because I felt that connection with him, that this man actually loves me. You know, quite an amazing experience. It was really wonderful. So going back to Montreal, uh, I remember having another walk with Srila Prabhupada in Montreal. And this was, the, the temple was he, over here, and then there was a, a kind of like a main street over here. And I, as we were walking across the street, Prabhupada was, said to me, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that he who spreads these teachings to others is very dear to me. And then he said, and our business is to become very dear to Krishna. So that was that. And then after, um, I remember we served out thousands of people for Shadam in Golden Gate Park. They were all lined up. And uh, then after cleaning up, we were walking back with a couple of devotees uh, through the park, I guess to our vehicle, and uh, we passed a public restroom. So I just ran in to use the restroom and the devotees kept walking. Mm -hmm. And um, we had, every day we always listened to Srila Prabhupada's uh, tapes, and I had heard a number of times where when there was a dog, Prabhupada would go, hut. That's how you stop the dog from attacking. 
And so I came out of the bathroom and there was a big bush and all of a sudden around this bush came four or five dogs in a pack and it was like they had already agreed we're going to get this guy. I mean they came out just growling and like surrounded me and I was whoa and I saw so I just thought immediately I jumped up in the air hot hot like that and they just kind of shook and and then I did it again and then they kind of just walked away and I thought oh Prabhupada you know everything that you taught us works you know it's all so real it's all uh, so practical and um, so that was my first day of uh, seeing Srila Prabhupada and being in his physical presence. Uh, I'll say this in Prabhupada's teaching, he, he never, he, he did not criticize or demean a person's beliefs. He just tried to guide you and eventually we learn that you can take any path you want into God consciousness, but because he was presenting a main road without detours, why not hop on and go that way? So I just, I just felt that he was very generous with his uh, with his information mm -hmm. and and how he presented it. He, he didn't he didn't he wasn't out to hurt people. So he went to those classes a few times, and then there were times where I'd be walking down the Bowery and I'd see this glowing orb coming at me, and it was him in his saffron robes. And just, you know, there's there's always a smell that goes along with places that are spewing over with alcohol. Kind of a sour, pukey smell. And he always smelled like, you know, we just came from, from the high desert and you can smell junipers and pine. The, the probably coming at you and there's sandalwood just encircling his whole area and, and the beauty of those saffron robes was just staggering in the middle of the Bowery so that was really lovely. At the press conference after Srila Prabhupada spoke there were some questions from the, the press and they wanted to know what is the meaning of this 400,000 species of human life and Prabhupada said, there are so many species of human life living in the jungles and in the forests. He just left it like that. And then someone else said to him, do you believe in angels? And Prabhupada said, yes, angels are Krishna conscious persons. So that was a good instruction. That Prabhupada wanted us to be angelic in that sense, that don't do any rascaldom nonsense and uh, because then you are no longer favored by Krishna and the Vaishnavas. So that was an uh, interesting instruction. So we were walking along the Landumsbrücke and there was a tugboat that was bringing an ocean liner in, big, big boat. And Prabhupada looked at that, he said, ah, oh, look at this. He said, big ocean liner, big powerful, big powerful boat, a little tiny tugboat. And the little tiny tugboat is pulling the big ocean liner, that's because how, that's how they bring the ships in. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, you see, this big ocean liner is very powerful, but the little tugboat is not as powerful but the big ocean liner has turned off its engines and so now it's being pulled along by the tugboat. She said, this is, this is an example of us. If we turn off our Krishna conscious engine, then Maya will pull us along. So we have to have our Krishna conscious engine on 
And then in that way, we, be, we won't be pulled along by Maya. So that was one incident in Landungsbrücke. So then after San Francisco, Sidavidi and I went to Los Angeles, because Srila Prabhupada went to Los Angeles. And uh, we would see him every morning during Srimad Bhagavatam class and then distribute books during the day. And then the next day we'd see him in Srimad Bhagavatam class again. So this is my second or third day there. And um, I had felt a relationship with Srila Prabhupada by distributing his books and, of course, following his instructions. But never really having his physical presence, I was praying the second or third day during Bhagavatam, during Jai, the Jayarada Madhava prayers before Bhagavatam class. And I was praying, Srila Prabhupada, I, I know you're my guru, you know, but I'm so, f you know, get, please give me some sign, you know, give me some sign. And I was just kind of praying like that. And all of a sudden, I got Srila Prabhupada this glance that just, boom, it just like hit me like a thunderbolt and it was gone. And I didn't even realize what happened until it was over. And it was like, oh my God. I mean, it's just like, I know Srila Prabhupada's real and he's the guru and he's my guru, fortunately, by some unlimited causeless mercy. And, but that he knew my thoughts, you know, and he, and he reciprocated like that. And I was just, that just blew me away and it increased my faith a hundredfold. I was cooking in the I was cooking in the kitchen with um, Shruti Kirti and Katila, and we were just cooking all day. That's all we did all day. I took care of the deities, I used to get up early and take care of the deities, and then we were cooking all day. So I never really got to the go to the discourses, but I got to hear classes. And so one time there was no, the pujari didn't show up to do artik, and Prabhupada was in the temple room, and so they I was filthy in the kitchen all day, and they they threw me out on the altar, and I was doing artik, and Srila Prabhupada was sitting there. And I remember offering and turning around to see him and offering, and I realized it was so clear to me he's always there. He was sitting there in person, but the realization was that he's always sitting there. You know, his picture is there and he's there. And it was really nice because that's also kept me going over the years to realize that he's always with me. Mm -hmm. His personal presence is better, but it's, it's all right, you know, I'm still present with him. We went on a morning walk with Srila Prabhupada in Geneva. Guru Gauranga was there, Pushta Krishna was there, and we walked past a, a building that was set into the woods, and Prabhupada asked, what, are, what is that building? And Guru Gauranga said, it's a restaurant. And Prabhupada said, what are they doing there? And Guru, Guru Gauranga said, they are eating only sin. And Prabhupada said, yes, that is the perfect answer. <laughs> Because when you're not eating something that's been offered to Krishna, the third chapter of the Gita says you're eating only sin. Mukundu and I were taking a vacation in upstate New York, and we were staying uh, at a friend's cabin. One day at that cabin, we put on our swim trunks, and we were going to go take a, a swim down in a swimming hole that was just below the property. So he went down a path and did that. Halfway down this path and kind of SUVs, big cars, came peeling down this dirt road and there were probably 10, 12 cars. And out of them just came police dressed in uniforms and plain clothes and uh, they descended in the, on this little cabin. They were doing the biggest drug bust in the history of the Catskill Mountains and they had been had this thing going for months, months and months. So they had infiltrated all kinds of businesses, uh, barkeepers, everybody, and put some of their undercover cops in. And so they were rounding up a lot of people. And 
when they came to our cabin, they found Mukunda, I said, in the, in the cabin next door. They arrested him as the leader of the drug scene in the Catskills. Then there was a good cop, back, bad cop scene going on. You know, we've smoked a little weed. It's no big thing. You can tell us about it. You know, if you got drugs here, you may as well tell us because we'll find it anyway. They didn't find any. They didn't find any. And they arrested Mukunda under a different name. Didn't even have his right name. He was brought in for arraignment, and before anything was said, it was dismissed. Just like that. When Prabhupada heard of this situation of uh, the Catskills bust, he was concerned for Mukunda, not, not in a, uh, he didn't have any judgment, no anger, just simply concerned that Mukunda was all right and that he had gotten things squared away, and are you going to be, is this over? Are you safe? Yeah. And so it was, uh, it was amazing. He was like a father. He was. So on one morning walk, I believe it was near Dumtor, uh, Prabhupada commented and said, the Germans are the most intelligent amongst the Europeans but they're also the most materially attached. So this is not such a great combination for spiritual life. So and that was, uh, he, he commented on that on one morning walk. And then on another morning walk, when I was taking, I was taking this, this one morning walk alone with Sri Prabhupada, we were walk, walking along the side of Sternschanze Bahnhof. And that was the, the, the S-Bahn station, which was near temple. And we were walking along, Srila um, Prabhupada on my left and I was on the right and we were just walking along, I was chanting. And Prabhupada s said to me, why are they all so fat? Uh, uh, speaking of the German people. And they, German people are dick, they're thick. You know, like. So, uh, and I, I thought uh, my, my understanding was they eat a lot of meat. But then I thought to myself, how can I say that to Srila Prabhupada? He's a pure devotee, you know? I mean, how can I say that? So I, I, in, in mid-course I changed, I said, well, Srila Prabhupada, I think they eat a lot of potatoes. And then Prabhupada said, no, they eat a lot of meat. And, and he couldn't fool Srila Prabhupada. And, and it's, you go into German stores, big stores and you'll see the meat section is a big big section they have all kinds of different wurst and all bratwurst and blutwurst and all, all, all kinds of disgusting stuff and so this is uh, the germans they eat a lot of meat so that's what Prabhupada said commented on so Prabhupada had sent us a letter and in the letter he said that I could start a fr French perfume business because the temple needed money. And Prabhupada said, he can do that if he can bring profit to the temple. In other words, he didn't want devotees being diverted from their sadhana or from their preaching, from Samkirtan, book distribution, in order to do business unless they could bring a profit to the temple. So that was a pretty good guideline. And uh, so I was doing that, and especially with essential oils, the spiritual sky business. And Prabhupada was going to leave the next day. So I, I asked around, what is Prabhupada's favorite fragrance? And the, the consensus was magnolia. So I had our producer create magnolia oil for Prabhupada and I gave it to him as he was getting into his car to go to the airport to leave France and who knows when he would be back. 
I never heard from anyone if he liked it or didn't like it. <laughs> but it was a nice, loving exchange. I was able to offer something personally to Prabhupada. The next story actually was in 1975, and I had gotten traded from Gainesville to Tripari's BBT party in O'Hare Airport. So at that time, I would maybe distributed for six or eight months in the airport, and during that time, the devotees were daily getting beat up there by the American airline mechanics, by some of the uh, um, maintenance people, and there were also uh, two police, undercover policemen who were baldy and curly. And Tranakarta, who also distributed there, his father had a famous restaurant in Chicago, and Baldy and Curly knew him from there. I just saw him a couple weeks ago, he was telling me. Um, so anyway, because the devotees were getting beat up, actually Pragosh, uh, they had taken him, the two cops, into a, an elevator, and they like, had done, ter you know, pushed his eyes in with their thumbs, and just had beaten him quite badly. And um, I remember we had a meeting, and Triparari said, look, this isn't working. Uh, you know, what we have to do now is if anybody sees a book distributor getting attacked, just jump in and help. Everybody just jump in. And that's what we started doing. And it really subsided their attacks once they realized we were going to fight back. Um, but anyway, Srila Prabhupada had heard. So he invited all of Tripurari's party to come to Mayapur. So that was the first time I got to go to Mayapur as a Brahmachari in 1976. And that was the year we chartered a 747 and flew over and you had Kirtan. Yes, yeah, the Captain Narayan, I think he was Captain Narayan, was the, uh, was the pilot, I believe. I'm quite positive. And, and because the devotees were uh, dancing in the plane and everything, it was difficult for the pilot. And he asked us to please hold it down. And I remember Vishnu John Swami was leading some of those Kirtans. But anyway, during the Mayapur festival, uh, one day Srila Prabhupada asked the whole Tripurari's party, who were almost all brahmacharis, and the Radhadamadar party, uh, to come up to his room. So we all went up to Prabhupada's room and just packed in. I was way back in the corner. You couldn't even move. We were packed in so tightly. And uh, I remember Tamal Krishna Maharaj gave Srila Prabhupada a check from book distribution. And uh, then Prabhupada started speaking. Uh, he said, you know, I've been given this, um, this mission by my Guru Maharaj, and he said, uh, what can I do on my own? But he said, cooperation is the essence of our movement. And with your help, uh, I'm able to, uh, in, you know, serve the order of my spiritual master. And then Prabhupada said, and some of you are being beaten? And I think Tripurari Maharaj said, someone said, yes, Srila Prabhupada, they're being attacked. And uh, tears began coming down Prabhupada's cheeks. And uh, he was just like, you know, saying, and he had such appreciation for the devotees helping him in his mission. You know, of course, we know how Prabhupada felt, this is my mission to my Guru Maharaj. And he had such affection for us, or for all of his disciples, because we were helping him. And it was just such a very, very touching, uh, touching moment. And I had never seen true humility, but it was, you could just feel that Prabhupada loved us. And he appreciated what we were doing. Um, and, uh, of course, we were all thinking, no, Srila Prabhupada, you're saving us from samsara, you're introducing us to Krishna, you know. But Srila Prabhupada was giving us appreciation for helping him, and it was just so endearing. And I know I went back after that more determined to distribute books, you know, than ever. And um, that was, uh, I'll never, never, ever forget that. And, I mean, he was saying, oh, yes, they also beat Hari Das Thakur. You know, they also did it to Lord Jesus Christ. And you are all taking on this burden to, to help me. And it was like, I can't thank you enough. You know, and of course, we're, we can't thank you enough. And uh, I, I had never, I mean, I really didn't even imagine that Srila Prabhupada was so, you know, I mean, because I always felt that he was just such a great, uh, 
king. Like he was, he was just so powerful. And, but he was so meek and humble and appreciative. And it was so genuine. It was just like, I think it just melted all of the devotees' hearts. Another morning walk, I was alone with Srila Prabhupada and there was a big billboard with a pretty girl and cigarettes and she, you know, I guess she was smoking a cigarette and then Prabhupada said, ah, cigarettes are very popular here. <laughs> of course the Germans smoke, you know, and, uh, but he, he commented also because it was a pretty girl, he said, you see how the lit girls are being exploited, they're being used for advertising and if, if there's a pretty girl in the picture, then uh, this is how w women are being exploited for advertising and selling. And then on another morning walk, um, um, I had to spit. I had some excess mucus. So I spit, I found a place to spit, and I spit over the side. But then he said to me, if it comes up, it should come out. So that even spitting, there's some instruction by the spiritual master. So then another morning walk, on that particular morning, it was cool. It was quite a cool Hamburg, even in the summertime, and this is, I think it was this in September, is not very warm. So Prabhupada turned to, to me and said, Okay, so today for breakfast we'll have pakoras and milk. And I said, uh, uh, hot milk? And then Prabhupada defined milk. He said, milk means hot cow's milk. <laughs> and so we went, came back and I made pakoras for him and uh, 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 mi hot milk. And that's what he had for breakfast on that morning. And then another morning walk, we were um, by the Aldi marked. There was an Aldi marked on the corner, and it was a sunny day. There weren't there weren't so many sunny days, but this was a very sunny day. And then Prabhupada stopped me, and he said, "Okay, this is what you you stand right here and face the sun." He said, and so I did, and I, and this is a graphic example of you know where uh, where the Godhead is light, uh, where and where the Godhead is, there's no mind. So he. He said, you stand here and you look at the sun. See, you're looking at the sun, no shadow. He said, now turn around. He said, and so I turned around and immediately, of course, I was in my shadow. He said, so he said, yeah, you see, you turn around. You're... So you face Krishna and there's no Maya. If you're you know, facing Krishna, there's no Maya. But as soon as you turn around, then there's shadow, there's Maya. So then Prabhupada gave a graphic example of that uh, particular phrase, it's, which is part of the Back to Godhead magazine. The men got, the men got so puffed up with their, right. with their uh, positioning of power and, um, you know, I was happy to hear a couple times, some Shunder said, Prabhupada would say, oh, are you a Swami now? And then we went up to Prabhupada's room for Brahman initiation and we were sitting in his hallway and the ladies went first. Everyone had a long stem rose to give Prabhupada. And as each lady would come out, we would ask, what did Prabhupada say? What did he say to you? And, and they would say, each one said the same thing. Prabhupada said I should cut my fingernails. They are too long. <laughs> okay, then I go in after the ladies and uh, I offer obeisances, give Prabhupada the flower, and I sit down facing him. And he said, uh, right here. So I moved a little closer. Then he said it again, right here. I moved a little closer. He said it a third time, right here. And my knee was almost touching Prabhupada's knee. And I really felt uh, uncomfortable that I was getting so close. And then Prabhupada said, no, right ear. <laughs> because you have to hear the mantra from the guru through the right ear. So that was embarrassing. <laughs> but 
it's uh, expected that you will feel like a fool in the presence of your spiritual master. So Prabhupada had the thread, and he, he kind of lassoed me with it. He kind of just like threw it over my head, and it went around my neck. And he showed me how to count you know, on the finger divisions. And he said, I give Brahman initiation to my disciples, but then they won't even wash their hands after they eat. So what is the point? <laughs> so that's why I always do that. I always wash my hands. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Prabhupada had standards that he wanted us to follow, but they were so simple. And it was just our laziness that kept us from doing that. My father, I, when I was in Berkeley, or in San Francisco, that we wanted to buy the temple in Mission Street, I asked him if he would give a donation. And he said he would. He gave $50,000, which was a lot in those days. And, he, um, and I told him, I said, do you understand about karma? And I explained karma to him, and that changed his life. Somehow he was right there that he understood. He could never understand if God was kind, why is a child suffering, the usual. You know, so then when um, Kirtananda asked him for money for the new marble floor in Bahulaban, at the, where the farmhouse was, because we built a little temple behind that. And my husband, he, he donated the marble floor and he adopted a cow. So he took, um, so he took my father into see Srila Prabhupada in Madhaban, because that's where I lived, was in Madhaban. And we had to move out and Srila Prabhupada moved in with, 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 there with, with um, you know, um, oh, anyway, okay. <laughs> and and um, I have to remember this though. Um, Parmananda and Sachabama, okay. <laughs> and Ladini with her deities, her Jagannath deities were there. And so um, he went in, they, my parents went in to talk to Srila Prabhupada, to Darshan. But I wasn't invited and I don't remember why. I don't remember why I wasn't, but I was outside. My parents never forgot what he said to them, actually, until they died. He was, there was, he was always in their hearts. It was very sweet. He, and mainly they listened to him talk. He, he talked to them about Krishna consciousness. And they were very impressed with him. I mean, they were, you know, my father almost became initiated, but not by him, but by Kirtananda. But Kirtananda wouldn't do it for some reason at that point. He wouldn't do it. But he was close to it. And when he died, my father died. He had on neck beads and he had jogging, you know, had, um, Cornu Thai deities by his bed, so worked out nice. His ashes are in the Ganges. It all worked out nicely for him. But um, I don't know exactly what he said to them, but he, they heard him speak. That was the main thing. And they liked him, of course, who wouldn't like Srila Prabhupada. We were on a morning walk at the Eiffel Tower and the Palais de Chaillot in Paris. And Srila Prabhupada was about to get into his car to drive away. And I just blurted out this question. I said, Srila Prabhupada, who is the devotee's greatest enemy? And Srila Prabhupada turned and he said, himself. Because if he does all nonsense and doesn't control his senses or his mind, then he cannot progress in Krishna consciousness. So he becomes his own worst enemy. So he said, you know, if you go to London, this, this would be a great service. So we went to Montreal and had a blessing from Prabhupada there. And then we, we meaning Mukunda, Gurudas, Yamuna, Malati, Samshundra, and myself, six of us. Uh, got on a plane, had a stop over in Reykjavik, Greenland, and then we had to go to Holland, four of us, because we only had enough money for two people to go in at a time. So we'd pull all of the money and give it to the first couple that was going in. And then once they were situated and got a place to live, the next two people would come, go. And the only thing they were asking at, uh, to get into the country in England was, are you a Scientologist? They weren't letting any Scientologists in. And so, uh, and then the next two would go in and the next two. And 
So, uh, when we got into London, it was Mukunda got a pinstripe suit, a bowler hat, and a walking stick. You just have to know him to know how classic that Mukunda that is. He will, he will play the part as needed. So that was Mukunda. So he and Samchunder were making business deals, finding wealthy people to help us out, doing this and that. I think it was Samchunder who said, we need to get the Beatles in on this. And uh, we'd send a really wonderful dessert over to Apple Records all the, you know, like once a week. It was a good hook because it worked. Yeah, it worked. And uh, Mukunda and Samsunder were ended up being lifelong friends of George Harrison. He called for them when he when he was dying to be by his side. Uh, he was very much uh, a Krishna devotee, very much. In Paris, on a morning walk, I was asking Prabhupada, because someone in the temple at a Sunday program had asked about Guru Maharaji, mini guru. And Prabhupada said, I do not know him. And later on he said, if you say you don't know somebody, it diminishes their stature. <laughs> so then on the morning walk, I asked Prabhupada about that. I said, they say that you don't have to chant the holy name because you can hear it if you listen very carefully to the holy name vibrating inside of you. And on and on. <laughs> and then Prabhupada, he got a little bit annoyed you know, you know, why are you presenting opposing arguments? And he said, uh, what is the value of they say? They say this and they say that. And then all the devotees, they chimed in, they said, yeah, what is the value of they say? <laughs> and then Prabhupada said, we are concerned with what the scriptures say. And then he quoted the Harinam Shloka, Harinama, 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 Eva Kevalam that you must chant the holy name, vibrate the sound of Krishna's name. Because when you are chanting Krishna's name, Krishna and his internal energy are dancing on your tongue. And we take the opinion of the scriptures. Are these other people as great as Krishna? Are they as great an authority as Krishna? So we will take Krishna's word over their word. <laughs> it was heavy. <laughs> Forty-two years ago, um, Lake Shivanti and I were married. Lake Shivanti uh, is the daughter of Walter Ruther, who is known as, uh, he's been called the father of the great American middle class. Um, he was uh, far, far, he was a, the president of the United Auto Workers. And um, Lake Shivanti uh, and both of her parents were killed in a plane crash in 1970. So uh, Lake Shivani's not feeling well, so I know her stories. She asked me if I can go ahead and tell them. So that's why I'm doing this. And uh, her first time meeting Srila Prabhupada was in um, March of 1974. Uh, she flew to Bombay with Govardhan, who is the Detroit Temple president. And when she arrived, Prabhupada was speaking on a, a dormitory rooftop. And she sat down and listened, and Prabhupada was basically speaking, you know, the ABCs, how you're not your body, and um, how Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And when Prabhupada was speaking, Lake Shivanti got the uh, experience, or the uh, realization that she wasn't her body, that, that truth became alive to her. And she cried with joy. She was uh, so very happy because uh, her life had been quite difficult, losing your parents at the age of 22, 
Uh, her father was revered around the world as one of the great social visionaries of the world. And um, she lost them just like that. So the next day she had a meeting with Srila Prabhupada. And um, she first told Prabhupada how her parents had both been killed in a plane crash in 1970. And Prabhupada immediately consoled her and uh, told her, uh, quoted a Sanskrit verse, how the self, the soul is eternal, never dies, and that your parents are alive somewhere. And then Prabhupada asked Lake Shivani if she wanted to get married. And, uh, and she, said, um, she said, oh, Srila Prabhupada, whatever Krishna wants. And Prabhupada chuckled and said, every girl wants to get married. And then Lake Shivani explained that her parents had a million dollar life insurance policy and her and her sister split it. And she wanted to use what she had left in Krishna's service. And uh, at that moment, at that time, she wrote a check for Srila Prabhupada for $50,000, which uh, he immediately used for printing Srimad Bhagavatams. Uh, just like his Guru Maharaj had told him, if you ever get money, print books. And as soon as Prabhupada got that 50000 he immediately put it into book distribution. And that's when book distribution was really taking off. It had started to take off, I think, re recently. Um, and so that was her first experience um, of meeting Srila Prabhupada. And uh, she felt, she actually, she, she, she felt that was her guru, Dakshin. Uh, for, because she had just been initiated also. And on another morning walk, it was a cool morning, and Prabhupada was dressed quite warmly. He had his coat. And then we came into the building where Prabhupada was staying, and we were standing by the elevator. And Prabhupada, I was doing this with my hands, because my hands are cold, and then Prabhupada put his hand over and touched my hands, and his hands were warm. And then he said to me, you keep this part of the body warm, and the whole rest of the body will stay warm. So he's giving me a, like instruction like that. And then another time on a morning walk, I took Sri Prabhupada to a church, that was very beautifully designed and it was like it was like a community church and there was a church and then there was a community around it and then Prabhupada and I showed Sri Prabhupada that church it was very artfully uh, designed and done and then Prabhupada commented yes we should have you know things like this also you know with a central temple and the community communities around it and so in that way Prabhupada was uh, commenting on, on future developments. And, oh, and then uh, on one morning walk, <clears throat> the previous day, Srila Prabhupada had given me some letters to go to the post office box. And so then I, what I should have done is I should have brought them right to the box and put them in. Then, but what I did was I came back to the temple and I gave them to somebody else. And then somebody else gave them to somebody else. And then they, but eventually they got to the mailbox. But then when Srila Prabhupada asked me about it the next morning, and Prabhupada was angry with me. And it was right at the same time, at the same point when we were by the elevator and, and going, waiting for the elevator to come to go up to Prabhupada's room. And when Prabhupada heard the story of what had happened, he was angry. He was angry with me and he said, you are irresponsible. And uh, I, was, I was taken aback. Uh, but I didn't think, oh, I, I can't say anything. And of course, when you try and say something, when Prabhupada chastises you and you try and counter it, it gets worse. <laughs> so I just accepted. It was kind, it was kind of like, you're standing next to a dragon and he's breathing fire on you. <laughs> so, but I just took that, took it and, and you know, accepted that this was Prabhupada's chastisement. So yes, I should become more responsible with things that Prabhupada asked me to do. 
when Srila Prabhupada heard that his Krishna book was now going to be printed in the French language, in the Krishna book itself, Prabhupada had written that whoever reads the Krishna book will become a devotee of Krishna. So it was very important to distribute the Krishna book widely because it contains the pastimes of Krishna from the 10th canto. And we didn't know if Srila Prabhupada would actually finish the translation of the 10th canto. So this was like what he was, it was his contribution to mankind to rid the world of impersonalism and voidism. In Brooklyn also, that was when he um, was sitting in that, that wonderful picture of him sitting in the rocking chair smiling because he was watching a play. It was Rasagyan, Lee Takshan, I can't remember the other devotee's name, but they were, the play was wonderful. It was Krishna Kidnaps Rukmini, such a wonderful play. And he was, he was laughing. I was in that picture, but way in the back. <laughs> but he, everybody's la you know, he's laughing, and everybody's laughing. And I remember he said, he said, this is better than the original. That's what he said. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> so when Srila Prabhupada was coming in 1976 to the temple, um, Govardhan asked Lake Shivanti if she could invite some important people to come and meet with him. And uh, so she invited the president of Wayne State University who came, a very nice gentleman, George Gullen. His father had been a minister and he really seemed to understand when Prabhupada was talking about how we're not this body and we're spirit. Um, State Senator Jackie Vaughn came. Uh, he had also come the year before, like Ashwani had invited him. So first thing Srila Prabhupada said to Jackie Vaughn, State Senator Jackie Vaughn is, um, Krishna is black. He said, he comes from your community and we worship him. And they both just laughed and laughed. And um, Jackie Vaughn uh, had a very good experience the year before. So when Prabhupada came again, he came back and he referred to Srila Prabhupada as your excellency. And um, all of these people, they were so impressed. Like nobody had ever met anybody like Srila Prabhupada. And uh, these uh, great academics. And then Lake Ashwani invited Monsignor Clement Kern, who was the leader of all the Catholics in the Detroit area. And Monsignor Clement Kern brought the priest, Father Shurman, who lived, had the church kitty corner from the temple. And they sat out on the veranda around the Fisher Mansion, it was a big, beautiful veranda, and talked for a couple of hours and really got into some in-depth philosophy. At the end of their uh, about two hours together, Father Sherman said, I feel very much like one of your disciples, that I'm here with the Master. And uh, I, you know, and just showed such great appreci appreciation. And later uh, that evening or the next day, uh, Prabhupada's servant brought that up and, and Prabhupada said, yes, he wanted to become my student. And uh, um, then they, and Father Clem, uh, Monsignor Kern also, he uh, was very elderly, but they were so very respectful of Srila Prabhupada. It seemed that anybody, they could just pick up that they were in the presence of a very special human being. So in Germany, there is what's called uh, Abstelltag, uh, or it's Mühl ab vor Abstelltag. And then at that, once a month, everybody takes their furniture or things they don't want, and they put it out on the street. And then they come around with these big trucks, and they pick up everything and take care of it. So this happened one time, and we, and we before, when Prabhupada came, we would go out and get all kinds of things. we get chairs and tables and, you know, you find all kinds of things. So on this particular day, Prabhupada was taking a walk with a lot of, devo of the devotees. So Prabhupada was going along and there were all these furnitures and things and that and things. And Prabhupada had his cane and he would point, oh, why don't you get one of those? And then we'd say, well, see the Prabhupada, of course, we've been out, been out. Well, we have one of those. Said, oh, so they went on. And, oh, why don't you get one of those? 
And uh, I said, well, uh, Srila Prabhupada, uh, we have, we have, uh, and then Prabhupada would go along. I said, and then Prabhupada came along, and there was a, a, a Persian rug in good shape. And Prabhupada said, oh, take that. You don't have one of those. Take that. So we picked up the rug and we <laughs> brought it back to the temple and cleaned it up. And then it was part of the temple room after that. And, and at, an, at another time, when I was cooking for Sridhar Prabhupada, Sridhar Prabhupada came to the door of the kitchen and he said, you shouldn't waste anything. That's all he said. And then he went back in his room. So that says to me that Srila Prabhupada was very conscious of waste and he didn't want to waste anything. And as we know, Prabhupada would open up envelopes and use them for taking notes and things like that. So um, we should be very careful not to waste Krishna's energy or not to waste Krishna's facility. And I, when I think about that, I, I think that by the, probably by the time when I'm a pure devotee, I'll reach the point where I'm not wasting anything. I went to Geneva, it must have been late 1971, and uh, Guru Granga also came to Geneva, but I went first. On my way to Geneva, I stopped in Lyon and did some Harinam Sankatan and visited a Spiritual Sky customer because I was doing that business selling the essential oils. And uh, the, the customer took the oils and he said, I have something for you. It was the Radha Krishna Temple album. And he gave that to me and I paid for that. Took a train across the Alps into Switzerland. Stayed with a lady named Madame Vautier that we had contacted in Paris. And I took that album, thinking that, you know, I'll give it to the radio station, maybe they'll play it. And dressed in dhoti, shaved head. And the receptionist said, wait here one moment. And she came back with Jean-Pierre Allenbach, who's like the number one DJ in the country. A nationwide radio station, Radio Suisse Romand, French-speaking part. And he said, uh, you speak French? I said, yes, I speak. And he said, do you know the Beatles? Because it was Radha Krishna Temple album produced by George Harrison. And I said, uh, my friends know them very well. And he said, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take your album and we're going to play three songs. And in between each song, we're going to play a Beatles song. And I'm going to ask you questions about Krishna consciousness. And you're going to tell me all about your philosophy and your lifestyle. So my original plan was to just drop it off. And I ended up doing a 30-minute radio program that was broadcast nationwide. Just, you know, Krishna opens doors for you. And the preaching opportunity is there when you introduce the book or even the record in that case. So we had difficulty with the authorities in Geneva. And they finally declared us undesirable. And Guru Gurunga thought that he should go to Grenoble and test the waters, see if it, people were more receptive there. And uh, he was getting, uh, he was very well received, getting a lot of good feedback. So I wrote to Srila Prabhupada and asked him, Srila Prabhupada, in Geneva, we're having a lot of problems. Our preaching center is not even in Switzerland. It's across the border. We get searched every time we go back and forth. And uh, in Grenoble, on the other hand, people are very receptive. And we have some potential devotees who are coming forward to offer their services. Should we close the, Gren the Geneva Temple and open a center in Grenoble in its place? Prabhupada wrote back, and he was, he was, I could see that he was annoyed by this misconception that we had, that we could close a temple so easily. And he said, no, you cannot close one temple in order to open a temple somewhere else. And that was very good instruction because we had to understand that we, we were inviting Krishna 
to come into our temple to reside there. Not that we could kick him out at our whim and take him someplace else. So that was very good instruction and it applied here as well in the Brooklyn Temple where devotees were saying, let's sell this building and move the deities to be closer to the congregation. But the real solution would have been, why doesn't the congregation move closer to Krishna? As Prabhupada said to me once, where there is Krishna, people will come. So let them come. <laughs>
within it, it said that both Lake and Shivani and I were maintaining ourselves completely by distributing Prabhupada's books. And Prabhupada said, that is the perfection of householder life. And um, and um, so, yeah, it, it was, you know, all the devotees came together and really put on an amazing, amazing event. And so after the devotee read the Hindustan Times article to Srila Prabhupada and completed it, then Prabhupada said, read it to me again. Uh, and smiled. Sura told me uh, of the three reports that morning, this is the report that made Srila Prabhupada smile. And um, then Srila Prabhupada asked how much money was spent on the wedding, which was about $10,000. And uh, some devotees felt like, oh, you're spending too much money on this wedding, making it very grand. And when Prabhupada heard, he accepted. He said, yes, very nice. And he was so happy it was done in a grand style. And how the um, publicity had gone all around the world. You know, it was on NBC Nightly News. It was uh, in all the major publications around the world. And uh, we had no idea. You know, it was all Makunda Goswami's arrangement. He just, he, he, he told me, yes, I called time. I said, Newsweek's doing it. You know, you're not going to... Let them get the scoop on you, and this and that, and just everybody showed up. It was uh, it was just such wonderful, and it was all positive. Uh, and I know, I'm not sure this was the demarcation point, but I know before that, Ambarish had, in the press, had really been treated quite badly, kind of like rich kid into a cult type of thing. His parents had kicked him out of the house because of it. Um, but uh, when the Ford Ruther, when they came together, it was just positive, very positive. And uh, all of the articles described us as a culture, that we were an ancient culture. And, and, uh, and the wedding showed that. Gopati Prabhu came and cooked, who was a wonderful, great cook. Um, Ambarish ordered flowers from Hawaii that were just the most fragrant flowers. And, they were offered to the deities and then made into garlands and every guest was given a flower garland. And just, it was, everything was done just first class and Mukunda Goswami set up uh, each media outlet to have a half an hour. So it was Ambarish, Lake Ashwani and myself and I was kind of like their corner man, you know, work, doing all the arrangements and just getting them from one to the next to the next and they both just spoke so well. And uh, they both just were such first-class representatives of Srila Prabhupada. In Germany, of course, they have lights that say, walk, don't walk. So I thought, well, we didn't pay any attention to those. So, uh, but I thought, okay, now here I am with my, oh, excuse me. Here I am with my spiritual master. I should be really careful. <laughs> I, and I, you know, I had much, a whole bunch of mundane morality in mind. So I thought, okay, so well, maybe if I come to the come to the street, then probably I should not walk. If it says don't walk, so then I came to the street and it said don't walk, and Prabhupada looked up the street. There was no traffic at all, so whoosh, off Prabhupada goes right across the road, even against the don't walk sign. So I thought, okay, there goes my mundane morality. So then I just followed Sri Prabhupada and across the road. <laughs> Prabhupada was very practical, even and he was not a mundane moralist. So. I had been asked uh, by the GBC to become the temple president in Amsterdam. That was 1975. And uh, we worked on the Bhagavad Gita and some other books, getting them published. Prabhupada said it was important work, do it nicely. And we installed the Gornatai deities, and then we installed the deities of Sri Sri Radha Gopinath with which are now at Radhadesh. That was on Lord Nityananda's appearance day. We went to the festival in India, Gopurnima festival, and I went into Prabhupada's room. He was having darshan, and I gave him copies of the literature and a stack of pictures that had been taken of the deities on the day of the installation ceremony. 
and Prabhupada had a, a desk, a low desk, and he took all, it was about 20 pictures, and he laid them all out on his desk so that he could look at them while he was talking to his guests. And then he, he looked at the, the pamphlet that we were distributing as an introductory piece of literature to the public. And Prabhupada said, oh, Krishna is looking so youthful. He is oh, the ever evergreen Cupid, looking so fresh. And he said, but all around me I see everyone is getting old. <laughs> and uh, he was saying that the soul is not subject to aging. The soul is eternal. And our life with Krishna is also eternal. That was very instructive. There's another story that um, when I was in Los Angeles, Prabhupada had called me into his room. And um, I had a picture of the deities from Paris, because this was not long after they had been installed. And I gave that to Prabhupada, gift wrapped, and he opened it, it was like a kid at Christmas time. And he said, oh, Radharani is so beautiful, he touched it to his head. And he said, I'm going to put it right here. I'm going to hang it on the wall right here. And I was thinking, really? She said, Prabhupada? Because <laughs> I know that he would give anything that was given to him, he would, he was not attached in any way, he would just give it out as prasad. But I went back there in 1985, so this was uh, 11 years later, and one devotee said, Prabhu, let's go to Prabhupada's room. It's above the temple. It had been moved, I think. And we went in there, all for obeisances, and I looked on the wall. There it was, right where he said he would put it. It was still there. And again, I went there five years later when I was in L.A. for a a uh, trade show, and it was there again. So I told the Pajari the story, and she said, well, if we ever take it down, I'll make sure you get it back. <laughs> so the, the point was that I had a little doubt. I had this little inkling of a doubt that Prabhupada was just pulling my leg, or, you know, he was just uh, saying something to please me. I misread him completely, you know, I, I apologize for that. And uh, <clears throat> we should always take Prabhupada at his word, that his words have power, that they can change the world. And if we repeat his words, then we can change the world on his behalf. So I remember making that little faux pas. It was a little mistake, and it was just in my mind. So it's over now. <laughs> I would cook Prabhupada's lunch for him. Then I would come out and give him massage and then go back in and bring his plate in and offer to his deities. He had, he had his deities with him. Uh, and he, there was a little closet in the room with a short, small, you know, small, small closet like this wide. And he would have the deities in there. And one time he came in the kitchen, he said, you come here. And he said, and he opened the door for the deities. He said, this is who you're cooking for. You're not cooking for me. You're cooking for Krishna. Of course, I, at that particular time, I didn't have so much of a concept of deity worship. And so it was a little foreign to me. So I thought that I was cooking for Srila Prabhupada. But Srila Prabhupada was trying to teach me also that you know, you're, you're cooking to offer to Krishna. So after the day after that, we had been trying to get mango for Prabhupada and it was not easy to find nice mangoes in Hamburg at that time. So we had found some green mangoes and uh, then Prabhupada saw the green mangoes in the kitchen and so he said, okay, I, Prabhupada would like to take mango with his lunch. I think it has some medicinal qualities. So he saw that we had green mangoes. He said, okay, this is what you do. You peel the mango and you take the green meat of the mango and you cut it up and cut it off and chop it up. Then he had me take sugar and melt the sugar without any water. And he said, now, and then he had me take the mango pulp 
that was green and put it in the sugar and then put it aside in a bottle. And then you could see that the, the mango was actually turning purple with the sugar and then you could see veins of mango going through the sugar and then Prabhupada would have this each day at his lunch time. And then this is also in conjunction with the don't waste anything story. So he had just told me that and so the peels of the green mango were sitting in the kitchen. So I, you know, I had just in mind, I shouldn't waste anything, I shouldn't waste anything. So then I pointed to, and of course the green mango peels you'd probably throw away. But then I thought, well, if Papa told me I shouldn't waste anything, he said, so I said, should I do anything with those? He said, oh, he said, if you want to utilize them, you mix them together with mustard oil and salt, and then you take. And, whew, boy, that was a rough one. <laughs> and not one of the devotees except Mandali Bhadra liked it, so we gave it all to him. <laughs> when I was the temple president in Amsterdam, Srila Prabhupada visited Numayapur, and London actually. He went to Numayapur and uh, he called for a Sankatam meeting. All the Sankatan devotees came into his room and uh, in Amsterdam I had been compiling the results of book distribution in the South Europe zone as a newsletter and I gave that to Brahmananda, who was Prabhupada's secretary. And Brahmananda showed that newsletter to Prabhupada with all the Sankatan devotees seated in his room. And then Prabhupada said to him, read it out loud. I had no idea that Prabhupada was going to do that. I didn't even know that he would read it himself. But it's being read out loud. And uh, one part where I was talking about the purpose of the Sankatal movement, Prabhupada said, oh, that is very nice. I like that. And he read the whole thing. It took quite a while. But what I got from that was that anything I write since that day, I always think that Srila Prabhupada is going to have it read to him out loud. And so I'm always very careful when I write not to criticize anybody by name, <laughs> to always be encouraging, to always be positive thinking and always glorify Prabhupada and give him the credit. Always give him top billing. He's the topmost man in our movement, the leader of the devotees. And so that relationship that we have with him has to always be respected. So that was an interesting event. So this was the day after Ikadasi, and then Prabhupada brought Came, he came to me or brought me to the room, to his room, and he said, It is traditional in India the day after Ikadasi to have puris and halava for breakfast. And so then I said, Oh, okay. So should I make that for you, Shri Prabhupada? He said, Yes. So I made puris and halava, and that's what happened. And so, you know, I, I didn't know that it was traditional, but it is traditional in India that people do have puris and halava after Ikadasi for breakfast. Oh, so Prabhupada, the first time that, I, that he came to that Manhattan temple, um, I was standing waiting for him to come in and I was holding my son Arjuna who was not two yet at that point and I was holding on to him and he was standing in front of me and Srila Prabhupada came by and he wrenched himself out of my arms and grabbed Prabhupada's feet. <laughs> so, so um, so the sannyasi started poking at him with their dundas. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, leave him alone. He's a great soul. You know, so my mother's heart is always satisfied with that one. And then um, he had, I guess his, his, his apartment there was either on the 11th or the 12th floor. So I think maybe the 12th floor. And we had um, another devotee, and I've forgotten her name. She was an older woman. We had built a roof to, rooftop garden for him. And... So because so he could go on the roof and have darshans, it was beautiful looking out over the city. 
So um, he thanked us. I remember we went up there and it was all done with all the plants and everything which we had begged, borrowed, not stolen, but we had begged and borrowed from the florists. And um, he was very pleased with it. And he said, he turned, and they said, oh, these women have done it. And he turned to us and he said, thank you very much. And then, um, so then I always, like I've always had children, so it's always difficult to go to all the classes and everything. So I finally got my son asleep. I think two of my children were with me at that point. The older boy had been in India, but he, I think he was back at that point, and I had the two of them were asleep. And I wanted to go to the darshan so badly. There was a darshan room, and I wanted to go so badly. So I really, I, my heart was broken. I got there, and uh, everything was packed. So I was so, so devastated. And Prabhupada looked up at me and smiled, and everybody moved, and I went and sat down right beside him. So here's another experience. Who can understand it? But it happened. I mean, I, you know, I was standing in the door. It was packed, and everybody moved aside, and I sat down. And all the sannyasis nodded at me. It was like a strange experience, a very strange experience. But it was wonderful because I got to be there. You know, I, I, he was very kind. You know, he would see our need. I mean, like Krishna does. He would see our need, and he would fill it when it was, when it was a good need. You know, so. At Bhaktivedanta Manor, we were on a morning walk with Srila Prabhupada and I was asking him a lot of questions in those days on morning walks, but I particularly remember asking him, Srila Prabhupada, there are many devotees who say that we were present as followers of Lord Chaitanya during his pastimes. Did we actually have a relationship with Lord Chaitanya? And Prabhupada's answer was, everyone has a relationship with Lord Chaitanya. He's Krishna. So I was astounded. You know, that everybody has that opportunity to engage in the Sankatam movement because we already have that relationship with Lord Chaitanya. Now just cultivate it, fan that fire, that spark. Then the next question I asked him was, Srila Prabhupada, do you believe that at some point in time, heads of state will take to Krishna consciousness? And he laughed, he actually chuckled. And he said, for that to happen, you must preach very vigorously. <laughs> so he was putting it on us. You know? After the time that I had the Ekadasi, and I asked Sri Prabhupada if he wasn't going to be taking massage. Then Prabhupada, on the, at, shortly time after that, he explained to me about massage. And he said that when the body gets older, the stomach starts producing bad airs. And if these bad airs are not distributed around by the process of massage, then they'll make the body sick. So, he, so I understood that this was uh, part of, the, of the, Prabhupada taking massage. So when you gave Prabhupada massage, Prabhupada would sit down, and then you'd start on his head, and you'd massage his head, mm -hmm. and then you'd go down to his neck and then to his shoulders. And then I got a direct experience while I was massaging Sri Prabhupada that Prabhupada understood that he was not this body. Because I had I was massaging his, his arm. It's not a big massage point, so uh, but I was doing a lot of massage on his arm, which wasn't really necessary. And Prabhupada looked over, and he said, he, he intimated that, "What are you doing? <laughs> You're massaging my arm. This is not a very important massage place." And so I said, "Oh, okay." So I went on to other places. But it, you know, you go, and then you you would uh, pop his fingers. And then you go down, and sometimes Sri Prabhupada, I don't know if he was having heart problems or something, but Prabhupada wanted me to press really hard, and I pressed, and I pushed, and I really pressed hard on Prabhupada, and Prabhupada didn't, he hardly moved, and I was pushing, and I was pushing, and it was over his heart from behind on his, on his back. And I just, I, 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 I got flustered away because I was thinking I was pushing too hard, but it, uh, Prabhupada wanted, on that particular day, a strong massage over the heart. And then you go down here and you go down, 
And so I, on, after Prabhupada had told me about the stomach massage, I, so I, uh, the stomach, you know, producing bad air, so I said, so I should massage your stomach well? He said, no, no, no you know, so. And then one day I was going down his legs and I got to his feet and I was massaging Prabhupada's feet. And you, Prabhupada liked it if he pop his toes also. And it was so blissful. This particular one day, I was massaging his feet, and and then probably you know when, when you're, I couldn't stop. I was massaging and pro massaging, and then I, and then probably said, okay, that's good. And I I didn't stop. I kept massaging, and I mean it was really really nice massaging feet of Prabhupada's feet, and I was experiencing on that. And then Prabhupada said, okay, and so then I stopped. During the installation, I was handing him the conch shells to bathe the deities. And then we went outside and I fanned him with Chamara for the whole initiation ceremony. He said a few things, like um, he mentioned that, because it was a big pile of vegetables that had been grown on the, the land at New Mayapur. And he said, whatever has been grown by the devotees is a thousand times more nutritious than what you can buy in the market. That was cool. And uh, he also mentioned, because I was coming from Amsterdam, we had about 10 devotees being initiated. I provided Tulsi beads. And then Prabhupada was chanting on them and said, yes, initiation means Tulsi. Because you know, everybody else had the neem, the neem beads. But he said Tulsi is the standard. And then we had the feast. So when we had the feast, I have volunteered all the Amsterdam devotees to serve the feast to 400 devotees from all over the, the European Union. And then Prabhupada came to the window of his room, mm -hmm. and I saw him first. You know. <laughs> so I said, Srila Prabhupada ki jai, and he raised his hands, you know, he was so blissful. Then he turned back into his room, and he told the, there are a couple of devotees, uh, like Bhagavan, Vishwambar, yeah. And uh, he said to them, this is all by the, the grace of my spiritual master that devotees can come from all over, so many different countries, sit down together peacefully and honor Krishna Prasadam. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> that was a great one. After Prabhupada gave a class at Uppsala University, then there was a skeptic in the audience and he was, the Prabhupada was speaking about four different classes of persons. And he said, so, so he was uh, skeptical, so he was saying, so, you, so you're the first class personality? And then Prabhupada stopped and he thought, he said, no, actually I'm a fifth class personality because I'm in trying to engage all the different four classes of people in devotional service. So Prabhupada was very humble in dealing with that particular person. So, and that person was uh, affected by that uh, uh, that answer to his challenging uh, question about the spiritual master's position. So Prabhupada took a very humble position in that time. I always feel loved by Srila Prabhupada now. I mean, I have a murti, of course, in my home. But I always feel that even when I'm not such a great devotee, which happens from time to time, that um, he's so kind. He's just waiting for me. And he loves me no matter what. He doesn't love me when I'm good. He loves me, period. You know, always loves me. He's always kind to me. And he fulfills so many of my desires, which are not necessarily needs. <laughs> but but I, get, I feel so taken care of. I feel so taken care of in Krishna consciousness. That even though I know I'm a single woman and it's more difficult in some ways, but it isn't really because Srila Prabhupada and Krishna are always there. You know? I, I, when I try to describe Prabhupada, I really wish that you could envision a man that was so spiritual and so smart and so sharp on his feet to respond to 
any questions that can be thrown at him. I also wish that you could know that he was tender and compassionate and funny and uh, and observant and f and had feelings that you think maybe a spiritual guru would not have that he would be stalwart and kind of aloof it, that wasn't Prabhupada that I knew at all he was He's very sensitive. So when Lake Shivanti uh, gave the donation to help buy the Fisher Mansion with Ambarish to become the Detroit Temple, that was the end of her half a million dollar inheritance. And uh, she had also given the, her house in Ann Arbor, which became the first Ann Arbor Hare Krishna Temple. And so Prabhupada recognized that and he told the temple president Govardhan, now make sure she is always taken care of. And Srila Prabhupada just had that wonderful personal nature to show such interest and to care about everybody. And, um, uh, and he, was, he was concerned, you know, that Lake Shivani be taken care of. And uh, he never referred to her by her spiritual name. He always called her Elizabeth. Um, even in October of 1977, just before Prabhupada passed away, uh, Udayananda and Govardhan went to Vrindavan. Uh, as soon as they got there, Prabhupada heard and called for them and said, come, you know, immediately, within minutes, come and... Uh, so they came down and, uh, and Prabhupada was, you know, the doctors said Prabhupada was so ill and so thin that his nerves were actually touching his bones. And any normal person would be screaming out in pain. Uh, but Srila Prabhupada uh, immediately said, how is everything? Are your accommodations good? Uh, how is Elizabeth? How is Ambarish? How are the devotees in Detroit doing? Like that, he had just heard about the wedding, you know, two months before that. And um, he just showed such fatherly concern. And, um, you know, I just never ever met anybody in this world that even came close to what, who Srila Prabhupada is. He definitely just struck me as a being from a higher realm who has just come here to help us. And of course, that's what he was. Prabhupada announced to me, so today is Ikadasi. So then I thought, oh, well, this is, must be an austere day. So maybe Srila Prabhupada is not going to take massage today. So I said, so no massage? Prabhupada said, no. And then I went back to the temple after that, and then I was contemplating and I was thinking, wait a minute, I think Prabhupada requires massage. Massage is something that Prabhupada needs for his health. And so then uh, when I came back, Prabhupada said, okay, let's do massage. So I, I gave Prabhupada a massage and then uh, I, after his massage, then he took his bath and then he was ready for, uh, he was ready for his prasadam. So I, I, it was, it seemed that Sri Prabhupada had made a mistake by saying that uh, he wouldn't take massage, but he did take massage. And so then when I brought Prabhupada's plate in, Prabhupada said to me, you should pray to Krishna for me. And I was completely taken aback. Here's my spiritual master, a pure devotee, and he's saying to me that I should pray to Krishna for him. And I, and I, I, so I was quite taken aback. And I said, I sort of said, Prabhupada, I don't think that would work. And Prabhupada said, why not? You're a devotee of Krishna. And so I just, I didn't go any further with that. It was, it was amazing to me that here's my spiritual master. And he, in a humble way, he's actually saying, I should pray to Krishna for him. It was amazing. It was just absolutely amazing. 
What struck me about Srila Prabhupada was that he knew all of us individually. He saw me in a crowd of 400 devotees sitting in his class. That he could give us personal instruction wherever he was in the world. We all felt connected with him. I, I think that was the most amazing thing that Prabhupada knew us so well and he was able to guide us, make adjustments, and instruct us. Just like when he was co first coming to America, he prayed to Krishna, please make my words suitable for their understanding. And Prabhupada understood exactly how to deal with each one of us individually. That was incredible. When the uh, Radha Krishna deities had been acquired in India and shipped back to Amsterdam along with Radha and Krishna there were the gopis Lalita and Vishaka and a deity of Srila Prabhupada with solid granite weighed almost 200 pounds and we actually after we installed Radha and Krishna and the gopis on Nityananda's appearance day and on Srila Prabhupada's Vyasa Puja Day, which was August 1977, Prabhupada was in London. It was his last trip to the Western world. He was thinking that he would do a world tour of ISKCON temples. His idea was everything was very bright. The devotees were fixed in their devotional service, their principles, following the principles but he wanted to make them a little bit stronger and more perfect so everything would be just right. But he didn't get beyond Bhaktan on the Manor that year. And um, when they were celebrating Vyasa Puja Day in London, we were installing the deity of Srila Prabhupada in Amsterdam on the Vyasa San. This was the first time that had been done. And we actually weren't sure of how to proceed. So we called up and spoke to Srila Prabhupada's secretary, Prajumna Pandaji, and he was asking Prabhupada while we were on the phone, how should they do this, how should they do that? And he said, a bathing ceremony, you know how to do already. But as far as offerings, he said it's not like offerings that are made on the altar to the deities. And as far as the outfit, he said, you just simply change it when it looks crumpled, was the word. But devotees, having so much devotion for Prabhupada, set a different standard so that every day Prabhupada would have fresh garments. And we installed that deity. And in Amsterdam, it was uh, interesting because the, the floor of the temple room would move, you know, like in waves, because it was not supported very well. And Prabhupada sitting on the Vyasasan, he would also move. You know, he would sway in the kirtan. He was holding the kartal and he would sway like that. So even after Srila Prabhupada's disappearance, which came on November 14th, 1977, we had had a special ceremony for Srila Prabhupada and offered Guru Puja, all the devotees had come back. We were all re reading from the book, Preaching is the Essence, which had just arrived that same day. And from that point on, we always felt that Srila Prabhupada was, he had not gone away, that he is still with us, that he is present, that we can devote ourselves to him fully, and that those who come after us can do the same that he can do for them what he did for us. And that was our feeling, that Srila Prabhupada had that kind of greatness, that physical presence did not mean that we could or could not serve him because we serve his instructions. So Prabhupada would say that, that the, the uh, spiritual master lives forever in his teachings and the follower lives with him. That means the relationship is eternal. And uh, we feel that Srila Prabhupada is always with us, whatever we do, in everything that we do.
Thank you. 